then right at the hour, Robin, you can jump in, turn on your video and kick us off. Most certainly, thank you. Okay, have fun everybody. It's gonna be great. So Leah, thank you for what by far is the best musical interlude we've had at the ZeroCon 21 conference so far. Wonderful. And I really think it sets the right tone for the great partner channel session you have put together here. And welcome everyone. My name is Robin Tim Weiss and I am the project manager of the Zero Project. And I would like to welcome you to what we all like to refer as the Zero Project family. Um, we have over 3,200 participants at our virtual global conference today. And uh, thank you. Thank you to USAID because it's thanks to partner organizations such as USAID that this conference actually comes together. Uh, we really value our partner organizations and the great work they do. And collectively, we all are able to come together and strive for a world without barriers. So that being said, a big, big thank you to Leah Maxson and her team who invested a lot of resources and a lot of efforts into this partner channel session. I really want to underscore that again. And for us, it's really a distinct privilege to have you part of the ZeroCon 21 conference. And that being said, really the stage is yours. Um, go ahead and thank you very much for everything. Thank you so much, Robin. We are very happy to be here. Hi, everybody. Um, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. My name is Nancy Taggart, and I am a senior youth and uh, workforce advisor within uh, USAID. Uh, I sit in our education office, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to this session on employing and empowering youth with disabilities. We have a very full uh, panel with lots of great insights. Um, so before we get uh, into the actual uh, discussions, uh, I wanted to just review some of the accessibility features for you all. Uh, so we will have international and American sign language interpretation provided today. And we will be spotlighting interpreters throughout the event in an effort to ensure they remain visible throughout. So hopefully you can see those now. In terms of closed captioning in English, those uh, are available in a separate URL, which will be um, coming to you in the chat box. So um, please see the chat box for that option. Uh, and then the webinar panelists will be presenting in both spoken English and Spanish. For those using the Zoom software, you want to click on interpretation at the bottom of your screen to select Spanish or English language preference. You click off when you no longer need the interpretation to return to the original source of audio. And if you're not using the Zoom software, note that, um, yeah, the closed captions uh, in English are available in the URL that we just described. And uh, so additional instructions should be coming to you in the chat option. So I'm very pleased to be able to introduce Ambassador Peter Vrooman with us today to help uh, give opening remarks to frame our panel. Ambassador Vrooman uh, 
is currently the, the ambassador to Rwanda. Uh, he's a career foreign service officer. And so prior to his work in Rwanda, he most recently served as the Charge d'Affaires and the Deputy Chief of Mission of the US Embassy in Ethiopia. And prior to that, he served in several senior posts, both in the US and around the world. Uh, we, we are very, very happy to have uh, Ambassador Grumman with us, uh, perhaps most notably because he's been such a champion for uh, programming with uh, and for persons with disabilities. So it's really a delight to meet him. I've heard great things about him and um, to hear from him today. So um, thank you again for joining us and I'll uh, pass it over to Ambassador Vrooman. Thank you very much, Nancy and uh, Robin Tim Weiss for the invitation. I will try not to take up too much time. I'm cognizant of the clock, but I'm pleased that both USAID and the uh, US Embassy Kigali could play a role in helping talk about access for people with disabilities. And, um, joining me as a, uh, there'll be presenters who will talk about our program, Orimu Kuribose, which means employment for all, uh, which strives to bring equity into our employment programs. But also, most significantly, we will have our, our mission, USAID mission and embassy disability advisor, Emil Bunigabo, who is a, a new hire, uh, who is a person with disabilities, who works as my advisor on these issues um, going forward. And so that's really key in, in keeping with and trying to walk the walk or walk the talk of nothing about us without us. And I think that's one of the great challenges that President Biden, uh, when he addressed the State Department uh, earlier this month and Secretary Blinken indicated, we need to have greater equity in our programs and in our personnel. So we're happy to have Emil He's here as a resource to me and to our team at USAID and to help us with many of our programs. Obviously, I'm, I'm new to Project Zero, but excited to be part of it. Um, your efforts to find solutions to create a world without barriers for people with disabilities is noteworthy. And particularly to focus as you are on the issue of employment, which is the focus of your research this year. I've had the pleasure of joining the Harkin Summit in the United States, which has attempted to also spark up the conversation between private sector, government, and disability pers disabled persons organizations on the same theme. And it couldn't be more useful, particularly in this year of COVID. We know that Across the globe, the issue of unemployment and low employment or underemployment is a challenge faced by developing economies and countries as well across the globe. Um, but people with disabilities are often on the margins. And so this effort to look at equity is critically important. I won't go into all the statistics because I'm sure most of you are familiar with them, but COVID, our understanding from early data is that has exacerbated the, tr the trends, both for people with disabilities and for their partners, parents, caregivers, and colleagues as well. So with the tougher employment competition um, for people with disabilities, one of the arguments that we'll have to contend with is one that my mentor, uh, Judy Human, has wrestled with in the course of her outstanding career and the work that she did as special advisor to the, at the Department of State. And she said one of the most simple arguments against change is to say that something's too expensive, unsafe, or impossible. And though we find here in Rwanda that there are many examples of companies and institutions that are proving that this is not so, that change is possible. One of my favorite examples and a, a, a creamery called Masaka Creamery that uh, had a grant from USAID, um, not because of the fact that it hired uh, largely deaf people among its employees, but for other purposes of generating employment overall. But the important thing that we noted in Masaka Creamery's outreach is that they, they did make an intent to hire people with disabilities. 
And that intentionality was critical to their success. And as many of you know, uh, companies that employ people with disabilities tend to be profitable. I learned that about Walgreens in the United States. And so it helps us disabuse myths that hiring people with disabilities um, can be damaging to the bottom line of a company. To the contrary, inclusivity can make your business more appealing and more profitable. So I really wanna stress, and I'm looking forward to hear from other colleagues about that intentionality of hiring people with disabilities and looking to, um, to hire people in all walks of our economy, but also in our businesses and in our governments as well. This year in the focus of the conference, this year has been about the IT solutions. Right now, we're on Zoom. Many of us didn't know about Zoom a year ago. People are using Teams, Google Meets, even Blue Jeans. And I think it's incumbent upon us, as you are all doing today, to include signing and captioning and other means of accommodation that provide for the accessibility of our audiences for our employees to make it possible and to turn this crisis of COVID into a possibility for having a more inclusive workforce. In the developing world where I've worked for many of my years, one of the great challenges has been transportation, public transportation for people with disabilities. The lack of accessibility on sidewalks with curb cuts that are missing. And so if people are able to telework, and, are, and have access to technology, some of these barriers, obstacles, impossibilities can suddenly be, um, can be addressed. And then we find, and I'm gonna quote Judy Human again, because you see that in my profile, she's been one of my key inspirations. We need to help people see that when barriers are removed for people with disabilities, everyone can benefit. And I have seen that as we make our embassies more accessible, as we make our recruitment processes more open and accessible, that this benefits more than people with disabilities, but everyone as a whole. And I think that itself is a, a narrative that's important for people to hear. Finally, um, you know, I think I'm excited to hear about our panelists from around the world and to tell you a little bit about a project that we we're embarking on a two-year activity that aims to strike or to achieve economic empowerment for 1,200 youth with disabilities in 12 of Rwanda's 30 districts. And we have high hopes that the partners who are engaged and you'll hear from them today will be able to make that real. That's our effort to help strive towards equity. And as many people know, equity is not the same as equality. It, it, many people need something different and, and yet they can still play a, a meaningful role in our workplace. So you'll hear a little bit about equity, what can be done to enhance it. And I look forward to the, the folks from uh, Umorimo Coribose to talk a little bit more about. It. So I'm gonna conclude my remarks at this point. I think I've taken my six minutes and turned it back to you, Nancy, and thank you. And I look forward to listening to what everyone has to say from around the world today. Thank you very much, Ambassador Bruman, for uh, setting the scene for our discussion today. It's really fantastic um, and, and gives us some thoughts for uh, the discussion and, and the, the questions and answers later. So I'm really excited to hear from, from our speakers who we have uh, today uh, and, and their experiences in both managing, designing, and um, supporting programming uh, with persons with disabilities, uh, specifically employment programming, but also um, cross-sectoral youth programming. So um, I'm gonna take a moment just to introduce everyone that we have with us. Uh, we, um, we're going to have a slide um, that showed their bios or their, their photos, but we don't have that, so I'll do my best to to give you the essential information. So with us today, uh, we have Sylvia Kananu, who is with IREX in Kenya, and is gonna speak about the USAID funded Youth Excel activity. And her colleague, Zara Lanez, who is also with IREX uh, based in Guatemala. 
We also have Steve Kamanzi, which is uh, who's with the Education Development Center in Rwanda, and Francois Karangwa, who is with the Umbrella of People with Disability Against HIV AIDS in Rwanda. And uh, from Nicaragua, we have Juan Manuel Sanchez with Creative Associates and Petrona Lopez, who's with Los Pepitos, also based in Nicaragua. And finally, we have uh, Melani Rotensulu, who is with the Indonesia Association of Women with Disabilities. So I'm very, very excited to have everyone here. We have uh, many perspectives to, to hear from. So I'm going to do my best to, to make sure we have time for everyone to, to share. Um, but I'm going to start off with one of our newest USAID funded activities, which is Youth Excel. And I'm going to turn to Sylvia and Zyra to talk about that program. Uh, but I'm going to start with Sylvia, uh, who I've just gotten to know well over the past few months because I work with her on that program. So Sylvia, um, I know that Youth Excel is a very unique program, but many others may not know that um, one of its focuses is really to uh, be committed to inclusion and youth-led approaches across the program. So I'd love it if you could tell us more about how you're incorporating these approaches into your programming. Um, all right, thanks so much for that question, Nancy. So one of the ways we are incorporating um, positive youth development and inclusion um, started right from the onset of the project. And so this is where we have taken um, a non-traditional approach to hiring. So um, Youth Excel, unlike many projects, doesn't have a director, so to speak. And instead, we have a model of shared leadership among a mix of younger and more experienced leaders. So um, there's leadership from Africa, there's leadership from MENA region, and there's also leadership now from uh, DC. And so what we have is a more, it's more of a mentorship relationship in place. And as an example, I'll, I'll use myself as an example. So in Youth Excel, we have um, Rachel, who serves as the consortium lead, and she mentors me and, and um, as I continue to grow in the responsibilities that I have in Youth Excel. So one of the things, again, um, that's really interesting is, is this uh, idea of building on the youth assets in management and even the inclusivity in terms of the diversity of the leaders that we have for this project. Um, something else probably I, I, I could also highlight um, is about the diverse Global Youth Advisory Council that we have put in place. And so this is a council that's responsible for making various decisions in Youth Excel. And so maybe before I get into um, exactly what these decisions look like, it's um, it started with the process. So one of the conscious decisions we made um, uh, in Youth Excel as management is not to be part of the GYAC selection. So what we did is we left this off to to, we have a consortium that uh, is comprised of local and, and youth-led organizations. We have younger members of staff in IREX as a whole. And so we, we, we handed this decision-making, sort of like handing the power to decide who is going to be on a GYC to the younger members um, of, of, of our consortium and our organization in general. Um, we also one of the things we also did was be very intentional about uh, making this an inclusive process um, and, and making sure that we had members uh, from the disability rights community involved and something that USAID also helped us with tremendously on that. And so going back to what um, the GYC itself does, so they are we are actually talking about having young people contribute um, to the change that they want to see. We have young people making decisions on, uh, on the Youth Excel project in such as they sit on the grant committee, um, they're going to be the ones in charge of making decisions on which youth-led organizations get grant support for the projects and activities we have. Um, they are in charge of uh, uh, you know, deciding what our brand logo will be, what our brand guidelines will be overall, and also developing our youth protection policy. So this, again, like going back to this concept of having youth be able to be a part of their own development and not just youth, but an inclusive body of youth. Um, I am maybe the last thing I can mention, um, uh, because I know we don't have so much time. Um, I also want to touch a little bit on how we are giving young people the agency and the opportunities to contribute. And this has largely been through the co-creation elements of Youth Excel. So um, 
youth excel began with a co-creation process and so here is where we had we brought in um a diverse group of of, of young leaders uh, whether from youth-led organizations youth serving organizations and they came together with um irex with usaid and uh coming together to sort of uh, uh, look at the issues that young people are facing and how we can address these issues through youth excel so this approach um helped help to have young people give their voice lend their voice their inputs their ideas which are all uh, really insightful to help design what youth excel actually looks like today and so um this approach again on equitable transparent and collaborative partnerships did not just end with the co with the co-creation process so uh we've also had um we're just getting out of our inception phase and we've been working hand in hand with these young leaders to be able to develop foundational approaches for youth excel and so um, I think maybe uh, one thing to also talk about this is just the intentionality of making sure that um, um, everybody who is all the young leaders from the different parts of the world, Colombia, Kenya, Jordan, wherever, um, are, we are being aware and, and very intentional about the identities in the room when we are having these uh, convenings, when we are sharing, and um, to make sure we have a balance of voices so that we can also have, hear from the global south, we can hear from uh, different people and and, and just creating an environment um, where different diversities feel safe to speak out and, 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 and share their voice with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's that's great. And, and I wanted to just note that Youth Excel is not specifically an employment program. It will cover multi-sector issues, including employment. But I think these approaches that, that Sylvia and Zyra are going to talk about have relevance across, you know, across the sectors and definitely for um, employment programming. So Zyra, I know that another issue that um, Youth Excel is taking, uh, taking on is the issue of, of power differentials um, with youth and adults and, and also other, other marginalized groups. So uh, we'd love to hear you talk a little bit about that because I think that's also a very unique aspect of the activity. Yeah, thank you, Nancy, and thank you, Sylvia. So um, this is one of the things I like the most about, about Youth Excel is the intended idea of addressing power differentials at all levels. Um, so we're surfacing power differentials first by being aware and talking about it, naming it. Um, so there are different roles and power relations within the consortium. We have the donor, IREX, um, youth led organizations, youth and youth serving organizations. And we encourage the diverse consortium to reflect and, and, take, a, and take actions. So I would like to mention briefly two examples of how youth excel activities are addressing youth adult power differentials. And um, one of it would be the design teams. So during the inception phase of our project, we've been um, working through these design teams, which bring youth and adults to work together to develop products and approaches um, that then will inform the program activities. So this means um, creating a space for people, we can say with more power, like international organizations and donors, to listen people um, to less power, with less power, like local organizations. And the other example would be what we've been calling the ICONS, which is a collaborative network. So in this, in this space, um, Youth Excel will bring youth and other stakeholders like public and private sector academia donors to work together to solve a relevant issue in their locality. So in these spaces, we, we want to break this false notion that truth or solutions can only come from authorized places like academia, um, the North, and of course, adults. So also we want to create an enabling environment to address these power differentials. And it, it implies the recognition of the inequality and taking measures. And one important step here is uh, conducting an intersectional gender analysis to inform all of our activities. And one last thing to mention is that we all know the risk of tokenization is there, but we want to avoid it by ensuring meaningful participation for youth and other underrepresented groups. 
And to finalize, uh, I would like to, to finish with a reflection about the, the right use of power. We as IREX know that we have this power and it comes with, with a responsibility, right? So first, we, we want to listen. We have to listen actively to youth, and it means spending time, building trust, and, um, and then use our power like to allocate our resources in ways that allows youth-led organizations to grow, scale, and, and build networks, amplifying their voices. And for example, as a convener, we can bring players um, to the table and, and have youth to get a seat in that table. So we have the power to do activities in a way to channel um, resources to the places most needed and to keep this kind of awareness at the forefront of our consortium. Thank you so much. Yeah, those are really important messages for us to be keeping in mind. And I think we all look forward to hearing how you think so goes as it as it rolls out. So I want to keep keep going to and turn kind of more to some programs that do focus on employment. So I'm turning to Rwanda now, and I really would love to hear from Francois um, and hear about how uh, you're using um, strategies to help improve programming for persons with disabilities in Rwanda. Francois? Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Nasi, for the question. So uh, in Rwanda, uh, generally, we have uh, strategies which are built from the employable program, which was implemented by UPHLS and uh, the HD uh, implemented by uh, EDC. Then from there, we have a UKB, which is a work for all activity. And this is funded by USID. So we have many strategies, but uh, key ones are, uh, the first one is the asset of the program, how the program is designed. Uh, we use the approach under this UKB activity, uh, an approach which is uh, market driven and the needs based training where youth with disabilities are provided with the skills in the soft and in the soft skills and the technical skills which are aligned with the, the person goals. So uh, this, is a, this approach is using uh, mainly the, the specific interest of youth and uh, take into consideration uh, the unique needs and um, uh, the specific needs of disability. So we have another uh, uh, second uh, approach, which is uh, uh, the, the, the strategy of using on job training system where uh, we are using the work-based learning uh, approach and uh, uh, through uh, the peer accompaniment and the savings and uh, where you can be provide to all youth, uh, I'm saying the youth with disabilities and the youth with, we, 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 without disabilities with access to the employment uh, using a, work, a workplace which is accessible. So uh, here we support uh, youth uh, with the disability and without the disabilities by empowering them uh, where they can be able to empower uh, one to another by mobilizing, uh, by mobilizing savings to the income generating activities to be able uh, to have um, the, 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 the financial startup uh, themselves. So uh, five, uh, thirdly, we have also another strategy of using uh, the contribution approach. So we, are, uh, we use um, the youth leadership and accompaniment approach that uh, we, 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 we help or we build the capacity of youth with disability and without disabilities to support by supporting them for making them um, to be able uh, to support each other meaning from youth with disability to youth without disability by helping them to achieve their objective and the helping them to have a strong participation uh, uh, in the civic in the civic participation meaning the community works uh, another strategy that we are using, maybe uh, the last but one, is uh, to enabling the environment strategy. So where uh, we use uh, uh, a strategy from the UKB, where we use the strategy to address all barriers, first by 
youth with disabilities and the, the barriers faced by youth with dis without disabilities for removing those barriers um, to help them uh, to achieve uh, the economic opportunities by removing all barriers that uh, those uh, that they can uh, face. Uh, within also this uh, strategy of enabling the environment strategy, we build the capacity of the partners, meaning we build the capacity of uh, DPOs and the, the capacity of non-DPOs organization that everyone can provide an inclusive and uh, friendly services. So for us, uh, this is a key one, uh, as it's an approach which is all partners are engaged um, to, from the designing, the implementation, and the monitoring and evaluation of this uh, UKB uh, activity. So also on the demand side, uh, you, UKB work with the private sector federation, which is uh, bring together all uh, private uh, business uh, to help them on how they can have a good knowledge uh, or a better host youth with disabilities in their, in, in their, uh, as in terms of providing to them uh, an internship which will uh, help them to provide a job to youth with disabilities. So finally, we use also partnership with the uh, DPOs, disability people organizations, based on the principle, uh, nothing for us without us, as uh, the ambassador uh, woman said, we use an inclusive uh, consortium where we partner with the DPOs and the non-DPOs, and those DPOs, it's with, or they are with the specific expert, expertise depending on the type of disability they are representing. And from there, we are partnering with non-DPOs uh, organizations uh, and everyone is learning from each other. And it's like a, a learning uh, and sharing session or learning and sharing system from DPOs to non-DPOs organization uh, to help us to build uh, an inclusive model uh, on supporting youth with disabilities and without disabilities for access to the employment. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I think this message of kind of reciprocal learning. So there's learning to be had on both sides and that we're working together. And there's also your message about peer learning between young people with disabilities and not with disabilities. I think it's really important and echoes a lot of the things that we've heard from our first speakers uh, under Youth Excel. So um, being an employment specialist, I, I love to hear about the, you know, the insights specifically around employment programming. So I'd love it, Steve, if you can talk uh, about your work with changing mindsets um, with businesses and the service providers around programming uh, for, for uh, young people with disabilities, because um, I, I know that's a big, a big issue. So um, can you tell us some more about what's worked with you with your programming in that area? Thank you very much, Nancy, and uh, thank you, Francois, for uh, speaking about Murimo um, Kuribose. Um, um, I just wanted to make sure that people get uh, to know what UKB means. It stands for Murimo Kuribose, which means uh, employment for all. So um, I wouldn't go far from what Francois has just mentioned, just to kind of uh, um, uh, put an accent or an emphasis on uh, uh, the supply side, uh, most of the time when you talk about uh, preparing or changing mindset of employers, we look only at the employer side, but you need to look at it in the sense of uh, preparing youth and equipping them with the necessary skills, the market relevant skills, those skills that are needed uh, by the employers and how these youth basically come to bridge the gaps in terms of uh, skills. And the entry point uh, for our market driven approach, as Francois mentioned, is what we call the market analysis, market uh, local labor market assessment that informs all the trainings that we do um, provide to youth. And when we do conduct local labor market assessment, uh, we try our best to making sure that uh, the findings informs even those skills that um, uh, would be tailored to specific needs of youth with disabilities. So by addressing that side, definitely when we prepare youth for work and when we bring them uh, to interface with employers, uh, we are sure that uh, they have the necessary skills. Um, Francois mentioned about uh, the soft skills that we offer, 
and that's actually not only um, provide the necessary skills that are needed at the market, but they also empower youth with disabilities with confidence and self-esteem to be able to approach employers. Um, so we have tried to establish uh, you know, work ready now curriculum. So this is basically a combination of uh, age modular uh, soft skills that have been uh, developed uh, in Rwanda. And that actually has gone all the way to so many countries um, um, in, through our iteration process. And we have embedded what we call a work-based learning. Um, this is a continuum process that we have tried to embed in the work now curriculum, whereby it's provide youth a step-by-step -step kind of process where they can um, get out of uh, the trainings, uh, they can get out of the, our communities to reach out to the employers, observe the workplace, interview with, uh, uh, with employers. Um, that leads to building a relationship between the youth themselves with employers. We understand that uh, it's very difficult for employers to open their workplace if there is no relationship building. I think this addresses the issue of uh, long-term internship that has been a, um, that has been a challenge uh, even within the uh, formal education system. So when youth go through this step-by-step -step kind of uh, uh, learning, they have employers have a chance to actually appreciate this type of skills, their capacities the attitude that they bring in their companies. Um, after all, employers are looking for people um, who are going to bring um, specific skill set that are going to address uh, their needs. So when we uh, bring youth into workplaces, when we empower them and they interface with employers through that uh, uh, process, that step-by-step -step kind of process, that uh, helps the employers to appreciate um, the skill sets and the abilities that these youth with disabilities are bringing on board. So on one side, we look at um, the supply side, uh, through empowerment of youth, building their confidence, providing the necessary skills that are needed at the market, but even uh, putting in place a system, an approach that would ena enable them to grow uh, from observation um, uh, through um, interviews with employers, building relationship, um, going through job shadowing and with those steps they lead to what we call a long-term work ex experience so that gives employers even the opportunity to appreciate so without necessarily running into employment you want to put that um, uh, platform or that um, system where by employers appreciate what youth are bringing on board so that's on one side on the other side um, based on the uh, bucket assessment that we conduct uh, we uh, try our best to making sure that youth who um, are trained are trained on the basis of the findings uh, from this local local market assessment. One more approach that we use is what we call creation of uh, a network of champions within the communities, whereby um, employers are um, come together with other um, development partners and the district and the local organization, uh, local organizations and uh, the local administration to form what we call a youth development alliances, where uh, challenges and uh, bottlenecks of uh, uh, what you, uh, youth face, youth with disabilities are facing in terms of employment, are discussed to making sure that uh, uh, these uh, challenges are addressed uh, collectively not only uh, on the side of trainings, not only on the side of uh, employers, but uh, any support that can be provided is provided through that frame framework. So uh, there's a side of uh, a supply that has to be addressed, um, but there is a way, there is an approach that also needs to be created at making sure that employers can, uh, can, be, can appreciate um, the abilities and the, the attitude that these, skill, these youth are bringing uh, um, to the productivity of the companies. Nicely said. Yes, uh, I, I like hearing about the different strategies on both sides and, and um, the emphasis on the relationships, uh, the relationship building is, is, is important in addition to providing opportunities for skills. Uh, so I want to make sure we, we have time to hear from both uh, our, our colleagues in, in uh, Nicaragua and Indonesia. So um, uh, Juan Manuel and Patron, I'm going to turn to you next because you have such rich experiences for Nicaragua uh, related to employment and inclusion. So Juan Manuel, maybe you can start us off um, and talk ab about some of the, the approaches you've used for working with families and service providers. 
uh, to support uh, persons with disabilities. Thanks. Thank you, Nancy, for this opportunity. Uh, the Creative Implemented USAID Tibet Safe Project in Nicaragua, as agreed during the co-creation process with our colleagues in the Nicaragua mission, apply a system approach considering that the main barriers for young people with disability to be more independent and included in the community are outside of them, are in families, in companies, and in community service. They are not within them. In Nicaragua, according to the official data from 2016, the, the latest, only 44.8% of the children with disability have reached preschool or primary school levels, and less than 4% has access to technical or any university degree. And according to another study by the Disabled Women Federation in 2011, 64% of the economically active age population with disability is outside the labor market. This is on a general barrier, not updated information to make a strong enough evidence-based policy design and planning. So the first thing that we did was to determine what these barriers are in the communities and in the companies. And talking about the companies, we realized that top barrier was the lack of knowledge that companies have about how to behave or proceed when a young person with a disability arrives at the recruitment processes. For this reason, TVSA increased knowledge about disability about disability in national laws and especially disseminate best practices on how companies can make reasonable adjustments to open doors to young people with disability. We were also able to promote with the companies an apprenticeship program for young people with disability, the first of its kind in Nicaragua, which fostered youth access to employment. Tibet say support to disabled youth was an open doors. And that was the name of our public campaign implementing nationwide jointly with our partners. At the community level, we carry out an accessibility mapping by using a mobile application, Suda Facil or East City, which was created by a Chilean disabled people organization. And we learn our cities and community services are far from being friendly or accessible, especially for people with hearing impairment. So we promoted several actions to increase accessibility levels, particularly for this segment, the hearing impaired people. For example, we launched a teleeducational program on sign language with Voz TV, a private TV channel that reached more than 120,000 community members. And we also trained 35 bank officers in sign language to facilitate access to banking or financial services for people with hearing impairment. TVSA positively impacted the lives of more than 300, 300 350 young people with disability, and 51% of that being women, and all thanks to the alliances and mindset changes with the private sector, Tibet centers, and the disabled people organizations. Today, I have the honor of being accompanied by Petrona Lopez, representative of the Panels Association of Pipitos, a partner organization of USAID Tibet Safe Project that has 34 years in country providing resources to family members for the empowerment and independent life and employability skills development of the youth with disability so they can achieve a better quality life. We realize that we should work with the environment and that environment include not the companies and the community, but the family itself. So I will stop here so we can hear more about the innovation that we promote with Los Pepitos and Tibet Say, for which I will give the floor to Petrona. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. Please, Petrona, go ahead. Muchas gracias. Eh, bueno, como ya más o menos bien mencionada, eh, nosotros como Pipito somos socios de USAID en el marco del proyecto Aprendo y Emprendo. Bajo este, esta alianza estratégica, bajo esta asociatividad que tenemos, trabajamos tres pilares fundamentales, viendo la integralidad de los adolescentes y jóvenes con discapacidad. Por un lado, el trabajo fundamental con la familia, ¿verdad? Como primer espacio de inclusión, donde eh, brindamos herramientas para fortalecer sus habilidades en poder brindar autonomía a sus hijos, sobre todo trabajar el tema de la sobreprotección. Por otro lado, trabajando con los jóvenes para brindarles los recursos para su empoderamiento y que ellos desde su propia voz puedan proponer acciones que les encamine a su participación, a su incidencia, pero también hacia los puestos laborales que ellos se sienten de acuerdo a sus habilidades que pueden este, desempeñar. Y en este, en este asocio, lo, eh, uno de los grandes eh, retos y logros que hemos tenido ha sido las alianzas estratégicas con diferentes sectores, tanto como organizaciones de personas con discapacidad como eh, la empresa privada. 
eh, uno de los logros muy importantes, como llama Juan Manuel Teste, lo mencionaba, es estas alianzas con los medios de comunicación para poder sensibilizar a la, al sector, a la comunidad, sobre las habilidades y potencialidades que tienen los jóvenes en el desempeño laboral. Eh, también hicimos alianzas estratégicas con centros técnicos vocacionales para el fortalecimiento de habilidades duras eh, de jóvenes con discapacidad, como es el Centro Juvenil Don Bosco, también este, con otras organizaciones de personas con discapacidad para poder fortalecer las habilidades técnicas de los acompañantes en este proceso. Eh, uno de los grandes este, retos ha sido poder construir como pipitos un modelo de inclusión laboral que sea como nuestra guía para poder acompañar a la empresa y al joven con discapacidad en su proceso de inclusión. Contar con este modelo ha sido producto de una retroalimentación continua de beneficiar, en este caso, de jóvenes con discapacidad, de familia y de las empresas que han estado involucrados en este proceso, que inicia desde un proceso de, de una vez que contactamos al, sistema, al sector empresarial, inicia con procesos de sensibilización sobre temas de discapacidad y derecho. Muchas veces en nuestras, en nuestras experiencias encontramos de que las empresas tienen toda la voluntad, tienen el deseo de realizar inclusión laboral, pero no saben cómo hacerlo. Están ahí los temores latentes porque no saben ni cómo iniciar. Entonces, como pipitos estamos ahí para decirle no están solos, les vamos a acompañar en este proceso, eh, va a ser de disfrutes, como bien decían ustedes al inicio de, de este evento, porque de eso se trata, ¿verdad? De que todos vayamos aprendiendo en el camino. Entonces se le acompaña a la empresa y muchas veces este proceso de acompañamiento hace que la empresa se sienta más seguro de lo que está haciendo. Eh, aún bajo el contexto de pandemia que nos acompañó este 2020, eh, como pipitos logramos hacer inclusiones de 33 jóvenes en el sector formal. Las empresas han estado muy anuentes, muy abiertas y para nosotros estas alianzas, estos procesos de coordinaciones que hemos tenido pues nos ha permitido ir fortaleciendo ese modelo de trabajo para garantizar la inclusión de jóvenes con discapacidad. Por supuesto, eh, esta experiencia tan bonita de estar en este proyecto de Aprendo y Emprendo nos ha dejado muchas lecciones a nosotros como pipitos, pero también al sector privado, a la empresa, de cómo podemos mejorar nuestra práctica. Por un lado, estamos muy conscientes de la importancia de seguir trabajando con la familia para poderle brindar herramientas en el trabajo con su hijo e hija. Por otro lado, seguir potencializando las habilidades, las destrezas, pero también brindándoles recursos a los adolescentes y jóvenes para que ellos pongan su propia voz, como bien han dicho, ¿verdad? Nada para nosotros sin nosotros. Y por otro lado, la importancia de estas alianzas estratégicas de la comunidad para seguir brindando oportunidades de inclusión a jóvenes con discapacidad. Eh, pues quiero cerrar diciéndoles que estoy muy contenta de estar escuchando a otros ponentes, ya quiero hacer alianzas con algunos de los que ya me han, han presentado y pues eh, invitarles a visitar nuestra página web www.pipitos.org para que podamos establecer pues alianzas en un futuro. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you, Patrona. Yes, I think it's, it's so fantastic to be learning across the different contexts and the countries. And I, I really like the emphasis um, that you you and Juan Manuel made on on working with families. I, you know, the, there are so many different stakeholders in, in these programs. And I, I think there's a whole set of interventions that are important to, to include in our programming that are targeting families as well as young people. Uh, so last but certainly not least, I, I want to hear from our friends in Indonesia. Uh, we have Mulani and her colleague Mangapool. I'm not sure if, um, if, if you both want to speak, but I want to hear um, about your perspective um, because you're working particularly with um, entrepreneurs with disabilities and how to support them. So I, uh, Mulani, maybe you can start us off to, to share some of your um, experiences and, and lessons. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, good evening from Indonesia, everyone. Okay, I'll start my video. So uh, our project is become independent, independent entrepreneurs, uh, what we call in Indonesia JAPRI, for persons with disabilities. JAPRI or is a US, USAID funded project to increase job opportunity through entrepreneurship for poor and vulnerable individuals. 
Entrepreneurship provides a way to improve lives, create economic opportunity for themselves and others, and contribute to Indonesia economic development for sure. Uh, during 2000s, um, 2017 and 2020, JAPRI reached out uh, 2018-12 beneficiaries. Its first target was youths ages between 18 to 30. The indicator were improving business, creating new business, uh, and in this phase, JAPRI found several infrastructure barrier for Anga, the name, uh, one of the participants who use wheelchair when they had to access the local offices. Mm -hmm. So Japri's second phase was in 2019 for women, supported by Women Global Development and Prosperity Fund. What was unique in this phase was the project also involved the men who were around the women participants for raising their awareness on gender equality, giving space and support to the women entrepreneurs. So coming to the third phase, JAPRI target beneficiary are person with disabilities, learning from what, uh, what had happened when Anga find, uh, find, found out uh, barriers, infrastructural barriers. Mm -hmm. So supported by Office of Economic and Employment uh, Empowerment, uh, learning from youth cases on disability barriers, JAPRI approached Indonesia Association of Women with Disability or HWDI to make sure that the meaningful participation of person with disability through its organization and make the project contact inclusively and accommodated uh, to disability perspective, including the availability of accessibility and the reasonable accommodation during the project implementation. With the support of the Institute of International Education, HWDI developed and adapted the JAPRI module and manual books to be more inclusive and easily to understand. JAPRI PWD is also prepare the team of disability perspective and interaction training for all parties, uh, this uh, th this team was uh, consists of uh, organization of persons with disabilities. So uh, involved in the programs, in order to the readiness and avoiding the discrimination uh, process. So uh, for the work that are being done, uh, I will hand over to the project director, uh, Mr. Mangapur Sinaga, to explain in detail. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Malani. And um, Magapo, we only have a few minutes, so um, maybe just a couple of key points you want to leave the audience with. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Nancy. I think I just want to add what uh, uh, Ms. Melani uh, already mentioned about our project. So uh, the, the key for, uh, important thing that we do in our project is we need to to give understanding to all stakeholders, not just for the, the target people with disability, but also for all stakeholders like governments, uh, university, uh, and also the, the, the private sectors. Uh, and we provide training to them and to give understanding about the people with dis disability with their situation and also how to interact with the, the people with uh, these uh, disability. So it will uh, 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 break the, the barriers with, uh, in communication, in relationship between uh, the, the stakeholders and the people with disabilities. We, we already uh, make a good uh, commitment coming from the stakeholders to support all, all of the people with disability after they understand what what the people with the disabilities need and also what uh, and uh, how they can communicate with the people with disabilities. I think that's the, the main important thing in doing this project. Thank you, Nancy. Excellent. Uh, I've heard such good things about your programming from my USAID Indonesia colleagues. So I'm so glad you guys could join us today. Um, we only have a few minutes left and we wanted to um, have time for some Q&A. Um, I think, and we also want to hear from our, our senior disability rights coordinator in Washington, Kathy Guernsey, who I'm going to turn it over to momentarily. But what, maybe what I'll do in the interest of time is 
just to encourage you to put your questions in the Q&A box as you have been doing. And I'm gonna ask our panelists to turn to those and try to answer those in the chat box. Um, if we have time, um, we'll, we'll take a few of those, but I'm gonna hand it over to my, my dear colleague, Kathy, who I've gotten to know uh, over the past year. Um, it's been a delight. Kathy is our, uh, as I said, our disability rights coordinator at USAID in Washington. And she w is going to close our session uh, with a few remarks and maybe an announcement. Kathy? Hi, everyone. Hopefully you can both hear and see me. Um... Okay, ho hopefully you can hear and see me. Um, gotta love technology. Uh, just want to um, make sure that colleagues are aware that USAID recently um, released our notice of funding availability for our FY20 disability funds, which this year is focused on the theme of employment and economic empowerment of persons with disabilities. Uh, we released that earlier in January. Um, many of you may have seen that announcement on various uh, international listservs, including the International Disability Alliance listserv. It's a competition that's open to USAID missions, but we advertise it to the public because we want to encourage organizations, particularly organizations of persons with disabilities, to approach USAID missions with their project concept ideas. If you haven't seen the notice, don't worry, we'll make sure that information about it is provided in the post-event email that we'll be sending to all attendees today. So look out for that. Uh, it just remains for me to thank everybody who joined today. I uh, really appreciate the remarks from Ambassador Ruman and your continuing leadership on disability inclusion um, in the work of the State Department and with our colleagues at USAID. Uh, those of you who were at USAID uh, and the embassy in Rwanda for your support for this, of course, our colleagues in USA's education office uh, for helping to organize this, and particularly Leah Maxson, Nancy for your expert moderation, and of course, all of our wonderful panelists for the rich discussion today, and everybody who helped to make this happen, our interpreters, the captioner for providing the access to ensure that everybody can participate equally, um, and of course, our colleagues at DEXIS for helping to provide the technological platform, and Last but definitely not least, everyone at the Zero Projects, we really appreciate this opportunity to share these experiences with everybody at your conference. With that, it just remains for me to say, we wish you all a very good Zero Project conference for the, the remainder of the time. And thank you everybody for joining today. <laughs>